Matthew 16. Take up from where we stopped last night. And verse 13, again. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, of course, we said yesterday, the reason why he asked that question was he sent them out. We look at Luke's account. He sent them out in Luke 9, 1 and 2 to go from coast to coast, preach the kingdom, and heal the sick. He gave them power over unclean spirits and demons and to cast them out. So he sent them out, and he sent them out to preach. So he says, oh, what do people say that I am? And, and that's the reason he asked that question. He asked them to preach the kingdom. Uh, what do you mean by preach the kingdom? We're going to see that in, in a moment. Uh, so he said, go preach. Uh, uh, um, uh, the, some, some the Matthew's account says the kingdom of God is near or is at hand. And some people still preach that today. Say the kingdom of God is at hand. And you say, what do you mean? This world will be destroyed. And Jesus Christ will appear. And you will be in the service. And you will not go. <laughs> you know, that's a, a kind of thinking. It's good to be zealous. But the first zeal a Christian should have is the zeal to know. Some people just transfer their hyperactivity into the church. Not that they are zealous to know or be taught the word of God. So there are people like that, you know, they're just so zealous. But he sent them to preach the kingdom. Why would he send them to preach the kingdom? That's Luke 9 2. And he asked them, who do you say I am? And to know how important that is, in later verses, which we're going to also look at in this service, he says to them in 19, I'll give, or to Peter, now I'll give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever thou shalt lose on earth shall be lost in heaven. Now, if he asks them to preach the kingdom, Luke 9, 1 and 2, then it says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Matthew 16, 18, and 19. And then he says to them, pay good attention here, that upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That means what he sent them to preach in Luke 9, 1 was a future event. So he asked them to preach a future event. Nothing new. Because that is the message of the Old Testament, a future kingdom. So it simply gave them to preach the message of the prophets. Some of you have wondered, what were they now preaching around? The message of the prophets, which is what you call the kingdom. And so he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom, which it, 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 it spells out will be upon his resurrection. We'll see all that as we go further. Now, in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, what we often call the Lord's Prayer. There are a friend of mine who say, if it's the Lord's Prayer, let him pray it. <laughs> a good guy. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, you have what is called prayer. And, and, and some people, I also have, at some point, way back, thought that this prayer was Old Testament. But you see, um, sometimes you, you make sure you are not too assertive on things you are just learning. I, I, I try to say that to a lot of younger ministers to be a little bit calm, uh, particularly when you have someone ahead of you who gives you the guidance, okay? Don't get too, you know, uh, assertive yet. You, 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 you pay attention. Sometimes I'm teaching a series and uh, I just have series 1A. Some guys have their own to series 5. And I'm wondering, I gotta come start learning from you or something like that. <laughs> it's just been in a hurry. And sometimes they get into a lot of bumps because they're not patient. Be very patient, okay? The same way you enter the university and you don't start a tutorial center in your pre-degree. 
Hope you understand. That's prophetic, all right? Come on, Matthew 6, okay? So he says, watch this in verse 9. This, after this man I pray ye, our Father which art in heaven. The intro of that prayer shows you it can't be Old Testament. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Now, notice that in chapter 5, which is the best way to read, he had mentioned in chapter 5 and verse 45, that you may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. Then again in verse 48, he says, therefore be perfect, even as your Father, which is heaven, is perfect. Now, we're going to study a bit of how Jesus spoke in the four Gospels. Now, just like many things that he will say, they were in the future. What he says there in chapter 5, verse 44 and 48, were not events that happened immediately. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That is futuristic. That was a promise he was making. When he says, for example, that you'll be like the, your heavenly father who causes his rain to fall on the wicked and the just. That again wasn't an immediate, it, doesn't, it didn't have immediate value. What he what was referring to was in the kingdom. And that's why he says in chapter 6 again, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Then he says, Thy kingdom come. Again, all he says here had to do with an event. Hadn't happened when he said it. That kingdom come, in other words, he's referring to an appearance or an event that was yet to happen. Pay attention. Then he says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then he says, give us this day, and that explains it. Verse 11 is like the explanatory text there. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, when you have the word day in scripture, you know, no, it's not talking about a Monday or Tuesday. It's talking about a time. The Greek is the word emeras. It's a time, a, a space or a period or an activity. Give us this day. Which day? The day the kingdom came or the day the kingdom come. It says, give us this day our daily bread. Now, daily, the word daily there is an old translation of a word that means always. So the reason why it's used as all daily is because the translators, which is an old English term, will feel you understand what it means by always bread. Always bread means a bread that is always available. So when it says, give us this day, that means, uh, and again, let's just add a few things. I know at Believer's Convention, I must have explained this text as well and many other teachings. But watch this. Normally, in the way that prayer was composed, you know, it, 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 let's see something quickly. I think something before that that I should show you. In verse 8, be not therefore like unto them for your Father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. Now, he's making a distinction between how the Ethan ask. He says they make vain repetitions. In other words, whatever is in their prayers are things that don't last long. So he says, you are not like them. Okay. Now, if you read that into chapter 6, you remember again that he brings out the same things that he says the Gentiles worry about, the Ethan. So he says, look, these are vain repetitions or repetitions of vanity, things that you will keep asking for, all right, and what you're asking for are vain things, things that don't have eternal value. Now he says, your heavenly father knows what you need before you ask. So what does your heavenly father know that you need? So he says, because he knows, put his words in your prayer. He knows. What do you need? Our father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom. 
Now, let me, you know, remember in Luke's gospel, just the Luke's rendering, Luke says that which of you has a son? Will he ask him for fish? Or ask him for bread? Give him a stone. Or ask him for fish? You give him a scorpion, is that it? Or ask him for an egg and give him a scorpion? He said, no. He said, how much more? People thought he's talking about be asking for bread. That doesn't make sense. He already told you, earthly fathers, give that. So he's saying, how much more will your heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit? In other words, he's not saying your heavenly father will replace your earthly father. He's saying he's going to give them much more. That's what he's saying. So he says he knows what you need even before you ask. So this prayer is God creating, let me use that phrase, a prayer point for you. This is what you should say. Or else, otherwise, it will be vain repetitions. You will be heard by much asking. So pay attention here. So he says, what is it that you need? He says, the kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, the, the construction should be, you give us this day. Not give us this day, it's not a request. You give us this day, which day now? The day of the kingdom. Don't forget, the kingdom is a promise. So in that kingdom, you give us this day, now change that word daily. Always bread. Right? Okay. Now if something is always available, it means it is sufficient. That's the word eposios in the Greek. Eposios means that which is sufficient. He's not talking about asking, someone say no, uh, that prayer is structured into number one, thanksgiving. Number two, the will of God. Number three, you now ask for your present need. Now, I engage someone who had a problem with what I'm saying. Uh, he said, no, it be, I believe that that is Jesus talking about us asking for material things. I said, hold on. Bread is what he said. He knows the difference between bread and car. In fact, in Luke 11, he says, or Matthew 7, which comes much after this, Matthew 7, ask, receive, knock, door shall be open, seek, you find. You know, we've used it for prayer, for all sorts of things. It's fine, God, in time of ignorance, God is still winking. <laughs> that is my own translation. Make sure you don't quote it anywhere. Okay, but the point is, he says there's bread, Jesus identifies bread, fish, and egg. He knows there's a difference. Okay, so if he says daily bread, for example, what if I don't like bread? And then he gives me bread every day. <laughs> Morning, bread. Afternoon, bread. This guy has heard me say this. They are our friends from Zambia. They heard me say that. And so I came to fellowship with them. And then they were trying not to give me bread. <laughs> That's why I have not repeated that statement here now. So the next time, you don't deprive me of daily bread. <laughs> I'm not a bread fan, you know, but I eat bread. Praise the Lord. I, I do eat bread, not daily. Okay. So you have, they give you bread in the morning and afternoon and evening. Say, oh, oh. Say, no, 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 no. That's not what he's saying. What is he saying? No, that bread is a figure of speech. Exactly. <laughs> so you know you can't be giving bread every day. You wake up in the morning, you see bread. You sleep, you see bread. You are praying. He says, I know what you need. Bread. So you already know that that statement is a kind of grammar. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so sufficient bread. A bread that is always now, the book of Proverbs already gives us an idea of that. Book of Proverbs. Somebody said, read one proverb chapter every day. 
for 31 days. So you will be wise. <laughs> Have you tried it before? You don't want to tell us here, right? Proverbs 30 verse 8. Watch this. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. It doesn't come from God. Neither poverty nor riches. These are things that are with man. Do you get it? But feed me with the food sufficient in the Hebrew. Sufficient for me. Proverbs The writer knows that poverty and riches are man-made. He knows that already. So he says, give me the one that is sufficient, that I will be content with. That is always. So when he says, you give us this day the kingdom, don't forget, the kingdom, our always bread or our sufficient bread, Then he says, what is that sufficient bread? You deliver us from the evil one. Hallelujah. You lead us from temptation, you deliver us from the evil one. Verse 12, you forgive our debts. So we forgive. I've done that explanation for us. I I don't want to go over it again. So we forgive those who have debts against us. So, in that bread you have forgiveness of sins. In that bread you have deliverance from the evil one. So, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. That's why he says, you seek first. Don't seek things. He's telling his disciples. You seek first the kingdom. What is in the kingdom? The sufficient bread. And his righteousness. He said, all these things will come. They are in man's activities. But what you should seek should not be what the men in the world seek. You seek the sufficient food. Who's following what I'm saying this morning? That's what he's saying. If you read on to chapter 6. He said, no, you seek for the kingdom of God's righteousness. Then when you seek for the kingdom, then God will begin to give those things to you. Those six things. It's not good. Seek the kingdom. The kingdom will bring things. <laughs> That's seeking things by the back door. <laughs> when you hear some interpretation of scripture, I, I, I'm sure Paul won't have a phrase again for that kind of gospel. You just say, you know, you have a lo, uh, 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 heteros gospel. He'll just say, I don't know this gospel. It will be very strange. <laughs> okay. So, you give us the sufficient food. Okay? So, this, you forgive our sins so that. Now, some say, you forgive our trespasses so we can forgive. No. So that. Because in the kingdom, see, it's the father's character that we mirror. The father's character, he delivers us. The father's character, he forgives us. And we, in chapter 5, verse 48, we are to be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. Chapter 5, verse 45, we are to reflect his character. Be like the Heavenly Father. So, the Heavenly Father forgives. He gives us the sufficient and daily bread, or the always bread, so that we also can give that daily bread to others. Because we, we're meant to forgive always as well. And so, he teaches that. So, don't forget that what he's preaching here is the kingdom. Which we have said, this kingdom is way in the future. Future from the four gospels. Take care of one word, just put it somewhere. Your will be done in the earth. As it is in heaven. Which means... That kingdom will be in the earth. That event will be in the earth. Don't ever forget that. 
So, in Matthew 16, we read that. Quickly go to Acts 1, just something else. Upon his resurrection, that Jesus, upon his resurrection, now Luke, in, Luke is the one who gave this account. In verse 1, the former treatise have I made with you, philosopher, all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Unto the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion. This is his resurrection. By many infallible proofs, being seen of them, how many days? Very good. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Take a look at that. He spoke of the things pertaining to the kingdom. That is, for the 40 days, he spoke of the things. Now, before we go ahead, don't forget that the same Luke, in Luke 25, 25 to 27, Luke 24, pardon me, 25 to 27, says there were the things concerning himself. Okay? So, if you have a Bible, you should. You just put a bracket somewhere besides Acts 1, 3. Then you put like a reference, Luke 24, verse 25 to 27. Then you could Luke 24 again, verse 44 to verse 45. Because that's what Luke was referring to, things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Which is why he said, O fools and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. Begin at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded them in all the scriptures, the things concerning what? Himself. Verse 44. All these things must be fulfilled which I said while I was yet with you, which were written in the law of Moses, in the, in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. He opened in their understanding in 45 that they might understand the scriptures. So put all that uh, somewhere uh, just as a footnote. Now in Acts 1, this is the, an issue here. When he was done saying that, then he says, wait for the promise of the Father, verse 4, which you have heard of me. Okay? Which you have heard of me. That is, you have heard concerning me. So the line of teaching continues. The promise of the Father is still one of the things, is, sorry, is still in the kingdom of God. Are you following that? All right. It's still in the kingdom of God. So he says, John truly baptized with water, but after you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When therefore they will come together, okay, they asked of him, saying, now when you, when you hear those words, it's not like everybody came together and they said it together. Lord, will you not? Huh? When you're writing a narrative like that, you put together the thoughts and the inquiries, the questions, which is what he did. And then he says, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? I want you to observe that question. Okay? Now, before we go ahead, don't forget, I've said it many times, the Bible was never written in verses or chapters. So, you are better studied in paragraphs. If I were you, I'd look at the question in verse 6, then look at the narrative of verse 3. He had just told them the kingdom of God in verse 3. So, you can pick your discussion from verse 2. Then he got to six when he was done preaching. They now asked him, when would you restore the kingdom to Israel? Which means that wasn't part of what he said. Okay? So, he now said to them, okay, let's look at that word restore. That word restore is a Greek word, apokathisteme. A-P-O-K-A-T-H-I-S-T-E-M-I. 
it's oftentimes used to put something back that used to be somewhere. It's used for a weed and ant to be restored to the normal size it was. You see it in Matthew 12, 13. Matthew 17, 11. And also Mark 3, 5. Mark 8, 25. Luke 6, 10 for healing there. You, you see all that used for healing, to put something back that used to be there. So that means that their reference point was the Old Testament. When will you restore kings to Israel? Let me give you a few history. The truth is, the fellow who was the king at that point was Herod. Herod was not a son of David. He, he was a, an external body. In fact, that's why they were so, you know, uh, uh, that's why he was himself... It was jittery when they said the king was born in Matthew's gospel chapter 2. He became very jittery because he knew that he was an illegal occupant of that throne, you know, when it, when, when it comes to succession. So in their minds, they wanted that kingdom of David where you have a military force and so on and so forth. So they asked him, when would you restore the glory of Israel? When would you bring back those olden days, those great events that we had. Again, that word is what had been now being brought back, which means that they were referring to history. You see it again in Hebrews 13, 9. I forgot to put that. Hebrews 13, 19, not 9. Now, it, it, it didn't, the way he answered them is what I want us to think about. Don't forget again, in verse 3, he was talking about the kingdom of what? In verse 6, their question was the kingdom to Israel. So, that's very vital. Now, he now responded. He says to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons with the Father as put in his own power. I want you to listen to this very well, you know. Now, verses I said earlier are human creation. Every verse in the New King James or the Old King James or the Newer King James, they are interpretations. Verses and chapters are interpretations. Translations are interpretations. I know that very well. Now, obviously, the way he responded to them is similar to the way he responded in two instances that you probably will feel that he continued the same response, but he didn't. In John 9, in John 9, and verse Two, remember the guy who was born blind? They said, Master, who did this sin? Who did sin, this man or his parents, he was born, that he was born blind? Now look at how the verses were constructed. Neither are this man sinned, nor his parents. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, with your knowledge of the word of God today, you will have separated that verse. It appeared like he didn't sin, his parents didn't sin, which can't be true because it will mean that him and his parents are the lambs of God. So the response, neither has this man sin nor his parents, ends that question. But by the time you say, but that the works of God, it appears like what he's saying is, the reason why he's blind is so that the works of God should be made manifest. Then he now says, I am the light of the world. Ah, that is the, a heavy contradiction. You can't be the light of the world and bring darkness to have light. So the question had been answered. It's not the man's sin, 
nor his parents sin. Okay? So that verse ought to have been separated. If at all, you need verses at all. In Matthew 17, another question was asked. Matthew 17. This is the question. Verse 19. They brought a, 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 a child that was possessed to the disciples. They couldn't cast the, the demon out. Jesus cast the demon out. And then they asked, why could we not cast him out? He simply said, because of your unbelief. That is the answer. Some of those answers are so short and sharp that you don't extend them. For example, people say, how be it this kind go ahead not by fasting and prayer? That's extending the answer. Why could we not cast the demon out? Because of your unbelief. That's the answer. So, in Acts 1, are you following me? All right. In Acts 1, 6, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Okay? The answer is no. <laughs> All right? Now, of course, the, the, the King James, which I use, for many reasons, my dad was a king, is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father put on power. That is like, now let me tell you how it could sound. The father will do it but you don't know. He will do it at his own time. No. Now, the way it is, is that he answered them. It is not. Or not. Simply means no. Then he says, for you, and he uses the word oik aimon, okay, not you or not, but you, pay attention, it's to know the times and the seasons. Go back to their question. They said, would you at this time, that word there is the word chronos, C-H-R-O-N-O-S, which is used for sequence. Oh, you have Given us the kingdom of God. Oh, you have explained the kingdom to us. Okay, is there an event after this? Would you, at this sequence of events, restore again the kingdom to Israel? He says, no. This is not in the sequence. It is for you... To know the times, which is the word chronos, the sequence, and the seasons, the word kairos, which means momentary or seasons, which is, this is the Father's will. That the Father has put in his own power, or put it like this, he says, to know the chronos, or, which is wrong, it should be the chronos as the kairos, not one before the other. The chronos, the order, is this event. Kairos is used for events, which he has put in his own power. Then he says, but you shall receive power. So he has Power, Acts 1, 7, exousia, which is authority. Verse 8, you shall receive ability, after which the Holy Ghost is come on you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, can we study together? All right, go to Matthew 28. Put your hands in there. Verse 18 then 19. So, in spite of everything he taught these guys, Israel was predominant in their minds. So, look at what he says in Matthew 20. Are you there? Okay, let's read together. Verse 18. 
All, no, that's the word authority. All authority in heaven and on the earth is given to me. Is that governmental? Come on. Commercial? No. Verse 19. Go in therefore, uh huh, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, according to King James, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, lo, I'm with you always till the end of the age. Now, put that aside, Acts 1 7 and 8. That is, the Father's kingdom is for salvation. Make disciples of every nation. Put that together with Luke 24, verse 47. Repentance and remission of sins will be preached in his name among all nations. Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. Okay? So, pay good attention to what I'm about to say. They were looking at Jesus' resurrection for restoration of human government and authority. He says, no, that's not what it's for. It is to be witnesses unto me of what I've done in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, there's a confusing term in verse 8, Acts 1, but you shall receive power. Looks like, what do you mean by? Now, the word but there is not the way you and I use but. When we say but... Is the word alas, A L L A S, taken from alos, same. Okay? Now, it has many variables. It, you could use it as however, moreover, nevertheless, rather, yet, or indeed. That is, this is what the Father's kingdom is about. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come on you. And you shall be witnesses unto me. Don't forget, he had already, when he says witnesses unto me, because he had spent 40 days showing them from the Old Testament the things concerning who? Himself. So what are they to witness now? Those things have been fulfilled. They will go into all the world to say the prophecies, the promises, the predictions have been fulfilled. Or the kingdom is now here. So, what happened in Acts 1, 6 and 7 was renewing of the mind. And many of us need to go through that. Renewing of the mind. They felt, okay, after your resurrection, after the ascension, after the indwelling, will you now carry out our own desire? You know, people think like that. That Jesus died. Say, you know why Jesus died and rose? So that your dreams can come true. Yeah? Do you even know my dream? <laughs> Jesus came to make your dreams come true. Whatever dream you have, you got to dream big tonight. Wow, 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 wow. You say, oh my God, I was feeling that preacher, man. Ah, oh my God. And somebody comes and says, let's check the context. Let's look at what no power. <laughs> Oftentimes it's Africans that talk like that. It's their background. <laughs> they grew up going to white government and all government. I love white government churches. I was raised in one, not born again, but raised there. Uh, my father, my dad, granddad was. I'm saying they're used to going to places. Hey, hey, hey. That man is powerful. That man. Don't look at him like that, oh. See, that man is wicked. He's, if he says something that comes to pass, <laughs> that's Africans. 
So he said, that man of God is powerful. It means when he's walking. He didn't just lift his feet. If you say, that man of God is powerful, say, what do you mean? He explains scripture. Is that power? <laughs> the African people. Voodoo is all over their mind. So, <laughs> they want to use the Bible as voodoo. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> Will you at this time carry out my desires? He said, No. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> no. It is not. It is for you to know. The Kronos and the Kairos, which is the Kairos, where the Father has put his own power. What this means, or indeed you will receive power. You know, he simply reminded them of what he said in verse 4 and 5. It's good to repeat. People forget easily. It's what he said in verse 4 and 5 that he says again in verse, one, verse 8. That means... Learn to repeat things a lot. People forget. Okay? He simply repeated verse 4 and 5 in verse 8. You shall receive ability. That is, you will take from ability to preach, to witness Christ. So, notice that in the resurrection of Christ, this is just an aside. I, mentioned, I wanted to mention it last night. Look at the sequence in his resurrection. And that will help many of us in the way we make disciples. The first thing he did when he rose from the dead with his disciples was to teach them. In fact, from Luke's rendering, he used 40 days to teach. 40 days. That is... He spent 40 days explaining the events or the kingdom. After which, what did they do after? So it means that predominantly the gathering of believers is to teach the word of God. I always say the teaching service is a primary service. It leads to the other things. Now, when he taught them for 40 days... Acts 1.14, they now prayed steadfastly. We should be taught, then pray. They prayed. Then what happened again? Acts 2.1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place, in one accord. And suddenly, verse 2, there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the house where they were seated. And there appeared unto them clothing of the fire, verse 3, sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues and speak in waters. So, the third thing that happened, they now have what we can call believers' meetings or Holy Ghost meetings. Now, after that meeting, the, the message of the gospel was now sent out to the unsaved, which is called evangelistic in that sense. Peter now raised up his voice with 11, Acts 2, 15 and 16. And then miracles, and what, of course, Acts 2, 41 and 42, 41 precisely, many believed the word. Acts 2, 43 or Acts 2, 42, they continue steadfast in the apostles' prayers, the fellowship, breaking of bread and, prayer, and, and, and doctrine. Acts 2, 43, signs and wonders were done by the hands of the apostles. Now, notice something that is teaching, prayer. Then we have believers' meetings that now will inspire us. Believers' meeting ought to inspire you to carry out God's assignments in the earth. Any church service, I made this vow years ago. Uh, there's some things you should make up your mind way ahead you see, if you wait till you become famous or known to have convictions, you will have none. Because whether you do good or evil, if you persist enough, you will be popular. Now, I made up my mind that there will be no meeting that I'll preach. 
anywhere in the world that will not stir in the hearts of people the reason why they should reach the unsaved. Years down the line. Because if you have Holy Ghost meetings, at the end of the day, you rejoice. You thank the Lord. Woo, glory. And then it doesn't, it doesn't stir in your heart the burden on the heart of Christ. I question the Holy Ghost meeting. Because the Holy Ghost in the earth is to convince the world about Jesus. So everything he does in the heart of the believer, even in the walk in the spirit, is to carry out that task. So I made up my mind. I said, whatever meetings, you will leave a place where I preach. The next thing on your mind is how to become the governor of your state. No. Now, can I make someone become a governor of a state? I mean, by motivation? Yes, I can. But not by the Bible. Not with the scriptures. I'll just tell you, you know what? It's our time. Too young, not too young to run. They will start running. <laughs> I can say all of that. Okay? But you see, I can do that in my own private capacity as a lawyer, okay, and as a businessman, which I am. Some guys don't even know that, you know. So, I can do that. But in my capacity as a preacher of the gospel, just like if you go to Paul's uh, office where he, he was making tents, you know, uh, if he converts the tent-making office to the church, he won't say, with these hands, I have ministered to my own necessities because he won't have a single dime in his account. You will have to be a real tent maker who makes money. Okay? So you could do that in your capacity. But when you come as a preacher of the gospel, you put aside your profession. There's only one single profession. It's Christ's profession. To save souls. And disciple them for the Father. That's all. So, look at the sequence of the meetings. They started teaching. He taught them. They prayed. Okay? And then they had Holy Ghost inspirational meetings. And then they reached the unsaved. And then miracles and signs were done. It's a sequence you will see in the book of Acts. So, it's not coincidental or accidental. Are you still there? Go back to Matthew 16. Learning something? Guys, are you learning something? Matthew 16. So, the kingdom of God was a promise that Jesus made. In the four gospels, that upon his resurrection, he now explained the things. That means it was an event. When it says your kingdom come, it's an event. It's the Father's will to give you the kingdom is an event. So, in Matthew 16, watch what he says to Peter. Verse, all right, remember the question, who do men say that I am? Some say you are John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, but who do you say, whom say you that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Then Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. I say unto you, do thee, thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever things or whatever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Okay? Look, 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 look at something in there. He points his attention to the kingdom. Again, he mentions the heaven and the earth. What we saw in Matthew 6, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Very consistent pattern of discussion. Matthew 6 and then Matthew 16. Now, look at what he says again. He says, Flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. It says the Father. Now, 
Pay attention there. Where was the father? The father was in Christ. So, he's not saying that something just happened to Peter as he was talking. Just stood on the pulpit like this, or on the stage, just, brrr. The father just took his head, brrr, and said, God, Christ, the son, I really God. <sighs> so, wow, what an encounter. No, no, no. I told you yesterday that the focus of that question was on what they went about to preach. And we said for them to mention Jeremiah, one of the prophets, John the Baptist, or Elijah, it means they were preaching from where? The scriptures. Good. So, they saw Christ as Jeremiah from the scriptures. John the Baptist, Elijah. Peter saw Jesus as Christ from where? The scriptures. That's what he meant. That I believe in the words of the prophet. And I'm saying, you are that Christ. So, Christ is not a deja vu feeling people have. Christ is the interpretation of the Old Testament concerning God's promise and predictions for humanity. Wrapped around a person. That's what he's saying. That you are that Christ. The Christ in the mouth of the prophet. You are not a messenger like they are. You are the message of the prophets. So he wasn't having an aha moment. Hey, wow, you are the Christ. So by saying flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, it means the scriptures revealed it to him. That's what he meant. But my father. Now, I want you to see something quickly. My father has revealed. He uses the word apocalypsis, which means to unveil or uncover. Now, what is being uncovered there is the scriptures. The scriptures is where the revelation is. My father has revealed it to you. I want you to observe something. I, I need your attention. Are you listening, guys? Now, what if my father has revealed it to you? What do you mean by that? He said, flesh and blood, which means sense knowledge, hasn't revealed it to you. It's not revealed by experience. Every other person who spoke in verse 13 and 14, they spoke out of experience. He says, no, this is taking the scriptures by faith. Okay? My father, which is in heaven, has revealed it to you. Now, let's see a few texts of scripture. How does the Father reveal? In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 25, Matthew's Gospel 11, 25, I thank thee, O Father, this is Jesus speaking, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast heed these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me by my Father, and no man knows the Son but the Father. Neither knows any man the Father, saves the Son, to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So he gives a background. You see the same statement in Luke 10, verse 20 to 22. Luke 10, verse 20 to 22. He says, Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Pay attention to that word written in heaven. Then he says, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, which is exactly what we read earlier. Thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. Now, that's Luke 10, 20, 21. Now, it appears like what he's saying is the father keeps some people from knowing. Now you have to know how scriptures are written. Like, okay, the father, he, he hides from him, reveals to her, you know, 
And then that's how it sounds. But the Father now chooses, he chooses to reveal to you. And he chooses not to reveal to you. So if he chooses not to reveal to you, that means he keeps the information away from you. That's how it sounds. But is that what he's saying? Now, he uses the word hide, which is the word cryptos. It means to keep from. That's quite a contradiction because in Matthew 5, 14, Jesus says, no man puts light on a brushel or a candlestick, puts it under a brushel, pardon me, but on a candlestick, it gives light unto all that are in the house. The city set on the hill cannot be hid. So, why would you say that, then say he hides it? That's contradictory. Because if it's light, it's not put on a bushel. Light is placed where everyone will see it. And if Jesus comes to the world and says, I am the light of the world, then says the Father hid those things. That's contradictory. Because light does not hide. Light reveals. It's darkness that hides. So, if the Father hides or conceals, it means the Father is found in darkness. Now, all you need to do is to read it well and understand the kind of language that is involved. Look at Matthew 13. You learning something? Oh, you sure? Yeah, I'm not done. So, how do you quickly learn it? <laughs> Matthew 13, 35. Watch this. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things that have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. How was it kept? I will utter them that were kept secret from the foundation of the world. He's describing the ministry of Jesus, quoting Psalm 78 and verse 2. In the parable he gives afterwards in verse 44, he said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure that is hid in a field, which when a man hath found, he hides, and for joy, therefore goes and sells all he hath, and buys that field. So he says the kingdom of God is found. Now, why then would he say the Father hides those things? That's contradictory. Now, you need to understand what he means or what he's talking about. Oftentimes when Jesus is speaking, he uses the kind of grammar that needs interpretation. What I mean by that? Sometimes he uses a figure of speech. Look at the Luke 10 again. Or Matthew 13. Let's just stick with the Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, it says in verse 16, Blessed are your eyes, for the see, and your ears for the hear. For the prophets and righteous men desire to see those things which you see, haven't seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, haven't heard them. He says, they desire to see. Now, in this instance, which we're going to explain in the, second, in, in the afternoon session, he's talking about the incarnation of Christ. But leave that out. Now, in verse 11, he says, because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, to them, it is not given. It says to you, it is given to know, but to them, it is not given. Why would he say that? That means he hid it from them and showed it to you. But not quite so. Read the next statement. For whosoever hath, verse 12, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. Whosoever has not, from him shall be taken away him that hath. This is not prosperity. Verse 13, therefore speak I to them in parables. Why? Because seeing, see not, they see not. Hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, by hearing you shall hear and shall not understand. And seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. 
Look at 15. For these people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they see with their eyes, and hear with their eyes, and shall understand with their eyes, and shall be converted, and I shall heal them. In other words, he points out that the reason why these people don't know is because of their heart. What do you mean by that? He's saying to us that the reason why he uses parables for these folks is because of their unbelief. So, if it's not known, it's not known because of unbelief. Not that the father is hiding it. The father hiding there is a figure of speech. In fact, it's more of what he did not do. Are you still there? All right. So, he says, it is for you to know. It's for them they don't know. The mysteries concerning the kingdom of God. So go back again to Matthew 13. Oh, we're still there. Uh, Luke 10, pardon me. Does the Father hide? What's Jesus saying? Thou hast heed these things, Luke 10, 21, from the wise and the prudent. You heed these things from the wise and the prudent. Take note of the two things we've read so far. The Matthew 13 says, it's not known to them because it's fulfilled in them the prophecy of Isaiah. What's the prophecy? They're seeing, they can't see. Hearing, they can't hear. Why? Their heart is wax gross, which is Isaiah 6 and 9. That's unbelief. So, he says here, that the father, he says he has hid those things from the wise and the prudent. From the wise and the prudent. Go to 1 Corinthians 2 and 7. 1 Corinthians 2 and 7. I'll start from 6. How be it we speak the wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now, notice what he says. Not known by the princes of this world. The, the champions, the, the rulers of this world. It's not known to them. In chapter, in, in, in verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Then he says, I has not seen, nor hear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. So, we want to find out how did God hide it. I told you it's a figure of speech. Look at chapter 1. Who are these princes? Chapter 1. Chapter 1 verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Born to us which are saved, it is the power of God. It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. He pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So, it's making a contrast between God's wisdom and man's wisdom. Are you following what I'm saying this morning? So, the wisdom of God is hid from the wisdom of men. 
The word of God is hid from the intellect of man. Not because God hides it. It's because their intellects keep the word of God hidden. Not that God hid it. So the princes of this world, the reason why they didn't know it was because of the wisdom of this world. So Paul goes further. He says, Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? After that, in verse 21, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Can you see the contrast? In the wisdom of God, the world by his own wisdom didn't know God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek for wisdom, after wisdom. But look at, let's take verse 23 together. But we preach, let's take it again, but we preach, go on, unto the Jews, a stumbling block, unto the Greeks. Now, look at the next verse. Unto us which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Let's take verse 25 together. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God. Now, the word foolishness of God, there is a figure of speech. Foolishness of God in the wisdom of the world. Weakness of God in the wisdom of the world. So, where is God foolish? In the hearts of the man that doesn't believe. Where is his wisdom foolish? Right there. Where is he weak? Right there. So, where is the word of God hidden in the heart of the man that does not believe? Hallelujah. Is it God who hid it? No. Let me see how we are following this. No, 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 no. One million times, no. The reason why it is hid is because of the intellect. It is hid because of the highfalutin discoveries of man. He says, in that wisdom, God's wisdom is foolish. In that wisdom, God's power is weak. So, in the darkness of the heart of a man that doesn't believe the gospel, God's light is hid. God doesn't hide anything. God is hidden from unbelief. He's hidden from an intellect that is superior in man's mind to God's word. Are you learning something? Don't forget, God is light. 1 John 1, 5. In him is no darkness at all. But you know, the light of God is darkness to the unbelieving heart. The power of God is foolishness. Are you there? To the wise man. So, what does Paul say? Verse 25. The foolishness of God is wiser than man. That's a figure of speech. It's also sarcasm. The sarcasm in there. The foolishness of God is wiser than you. The weakness of God is stronger than you. And you see your calling, brethren. How that not many wise men out of the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Let's take verse 27 together. God has chosen. Everybody, let's go. 27, let's go. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And he has chosen the weak things of the world. Wait, wait. The word foolish things of the world is also a figure of speech. That is what the world will call foolish. What it will call weak. It's meant to destroy man's wisdom. Is meant to destroy man's power, what he sees as power. He says, and the base things of the world, the things that are despised, God has chosen. Yeah, the things that are not to bring to nothing, the things that are. Let's take 29 together. That no flesh should glory. That's why Paul says, when I came to you, I came not in the excellency of speech. My speech and my preaching was not in the enticing words. That is, when you use the world's wisdom to communicate the gospel, you are hiding the gospel. That's what you are doing. Because the world in his wisdom did not know God. 
So where is the wise? Where are the professors in the university? You didn't get that. I said, where are the professors in the university? We thank you, professors. Where are the wise? Where are the intellectuals? He said, what we preach is foolishness to them. I hasn't seen it. Hears haven't heard it. Doesn't enter to the heart of man. Man can't comprehend the gospel. He can't figure it out. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. Who are the us? We that have believed. So God has hid those things from the wise and the prudent. So the wise and the prudent there in Luke 10 will stand for unbelief. Right? He has revealed them unto what? Babes. Babes there will be what? Those who are ready to hear it. Babes will stand for faith. You receive the kingdom like a babe. You know nothing. So, did God hide his word? No. Is his word hidden? Yes. Why is his word hidden? It's hidden to the unregenerate heart or the unbelieving heart. What is the word revealed to? One who wants to hear it. Who acts like a babe. God does not hide his word. Hallelujah. It's the simplicity of his communication that looks foolish. So, Paul says, Have the princes of this world known it? Because in their wisdom, they didn't know God. You learning something here? So God doesn't hide. He says, where are the wise sophos in the Greek? Those who are masters of insight. Where is the prudent sunetos? Those who are known to be skillful, crafty. Those who, who can have their way. Oh my God. That guy, you know sometimes we celebrate such folks in the church. We say, we're bringing to tomorrow uh, this fellow. Is, in the last 25 years, he's, he, he reached top 1,000 scientists in the world. Say, so, oh, wow. So, you know, if you, if you go and Google his name, the first 1,000 pages, go and check Wikipedia, say, wow! And say, oh, my God. Ah, ah. Oh, yes. And the guy just comes. He says, in 2014, I spoke at United Nations. 2000, I say, wow! Are you not carnal? <laughs> I work as mere men. Is that the wisdom of God? The wisdom of God is Christ crucified. Hallelujah. That's, that's, that's the wisdom of God. He says, to that intellectual. So it's an insult to bring people to church meetings to come and, what is it, bamboozle now? Wars! With, I want to show you 14 key principles of the 21st century market. One, perception. It's been discovered in the last 62 years that the way to perceive where the financial dynamics are going to, mm, that guy's deep, man. That guy's deep. That guy's deep. <laughs> the guy now comes. It's in Exodus five times. The book of Psalms uses it 14 times. What's all this? Who's asking me for mathematics? His carnal mind is battling the wisdom of God. You know what? Jesus rejoiced over that wisdom. He rejoiced over that wisdom. Hallelujah. <laughs> glory to God. Woo, glory to God. You following this? So flesh and blood hasn't revealed it. But my father, how does the father reveal when you believe the words of the prophet? Peter simply believed the word. It was not an encounter. Oh, thou art the Christ. No, 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 no. Peter simply said, you are the one that Moses spoke about. You are the one that Samuel spoke about. Flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you. But my father, how does the father reveal? The moment I believe the words of the prophet, the father reveals himself to me. Hallelujah. Does that make sense? 
Hallelujah. So the father doesn't hide. No, say, don't see me. No, the father is light. In him is no darkness at all. Glory is the Lord. Are you still there? So the reason why we had types and shadows in the old covenant wasn't the father's communication. It was man's communication because of the state of people's hearts. The father speaks in light. Look at John. John says in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. John's gospel of the one verse one. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was anything that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Talking about Genesis now. The light shined in the darkness. And the darkness couldn't comprehend. So God's message from Genesis to Malachi was not types and shadows. His message was light that kept shining. Types and shadows was how men saw it in their hearts. We'll see a few things as we study. Are you there? Praise the Lord. <laughs> so what happened to Peter? Faith in the Old Testament. What was the revelation of Peter in Mark, Matthew 16, 15? Faith in the words of the prophets. So faith in the words of the prophet is the revelation of the father. Because that's not flesh and blood. Let me see if you're following this, come on. Faith in the words of the prophets. God, so when you read and the father hid those things. It's not that he hides it. No. His word is hidden from the wisdom of the world. Because unbelief glorifies man's wisdom. Faith celebrates God's wisdom. So in unbelief, God is hidden. It's just like you say, Did, does God destroy the sinner? No. Does God destroy the sinner? Yes. How you no, no, I'm not contradicting myself. God saves. His power can only save. And his power saves those who believe. Now, if you do not believe, God doesn't save you. That looks like that's what it means. But not that God did want to save you or didn't have the power to save you, but your unbelief brought destruction. So the heart of the man that glorifies man's wisdom is hid from the wisdom of God. So say, what about Colossians 1.26 or Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4 and 5? From the prophets, we'll see what that means. So God doesn't hide. God is light. In him is no darkness at all. Hallelujah. Learning something there? So the foolishness of God, just like when you say the wrath of God, you find the word wrath of God on the disobedience, those that don't believe. So it is unbelief that is called wrath. Unbelief. So a man who doesn't believe the gospel is called a man of anger towards God. Unbelief. Is that wrath? We we'll see all that. Uh, if we can refer you to other materials to see that. So the foolishness of God is found where in the heart of man. The weakness of God is found where in the heart of man. It's not God. It's not found in God. Just like the wrath of God is not found in God. It's found in man. So all those things describe man's attitude when he doesn't believe the gospel. God is mentioned even though he's not active. Oftentimes, it's his absence that is referred to. So, the foolishness of God, the weakness of God, and then the wisdom of God. You learning something here? So, go back to Matthew 16. So, what happened to Peter? An experience of faith. All right, good. Matthew 16. Thou art the Christ, he says, the son of the living God, verse 16. Where did Peter get that confession from? From the mouth of who? 
prophets. So revelation happens when we believe. If our gospel be hid, 2 Corinthians 4, 3, is hid to them who are what? Lost. In whom the God of this world, verse 4, has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, which is the image of God, shall shine where? So why is the gospel hid? To them that believe not. So, what happened to Peter in Matthew 16 was faith in the words of the prophets. That's why, upon the resurrection, Jesus' rebuke of his disciples was the word sclerocardia, hardness of heart. Mark 16, verse 14, he rebuked them for their unbelief, apistio, and sclerocardia, hardness of the heart. Same thing he says in Matthew 19, verse 8. Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, permitted you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. In Luke 24, 25, it says, O fools, slow of heart to believe. Slow of heart, brothers, cardia, slow of heart to believe. All that the prophets have spoken. So what opened their understanding in Luke 24, 45 was what? Faith in the words of the prophets. The Spirit of God acts in tandem with a man's attitude. How does he act when I know nothing? When I claim nothing? When I'm a babe, figuratively speaking? When I don't try to impose my imaginations on God's word? When I say, I be just like Abraham, Abraham believed in the Lord. Genesis 15 and 6, which is the word E.W. Kenyon calls it unqualified committal. To abandon yourself to anything God says. So when you do that, you are called a babe. He reveals his word to babes. You know, the word babes is also used for spiritual infanthood. You are babes in Christ. And it says, I fed you with milk and not with meat, which is not positive. Ephesians 4.14, that's 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 2. Ephesians 4.14, yeah, you be no longer babes tossed to and fro, which is the spiritual growth. So babes can be positive when it deals with believing the gospel, all right, but becomes negative when you are not growing in the gospel. Let me see your hand here. So that's why you study words in context. I've told you that many times. So why did he rebuke them? He rebuked them for the hardness of their heart. For unbelief. Unbelief. So, where does revelation come in? Revelation is birthed in faith in the gospel of the Old Testament. Revelation is not a fuzzy feeling. Oh, my God. See, revelation. Oh, oh. No, 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 no. That, that's just feeling good. Revelation is birthed in faith in the gospel. Sometimes it's a man shouting that has no revelation. When revelation happens, a door of light is opened. Faith births it. So when it says, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, or kingdom of heaven, Matthew 13, 11. Why is it given to them? Because they believe. Unto them it is not given. Why? Because they do not believe. So, does God select who he reveals to? No. Does God select who he reveals to? Yes. They, they are both yes and no. No, he doesn't hide it. Yes, because God can only reveal himself by faith. So, if God has chosen to be known by faith, it therefore, without being active, hides his word. Because that's the only way you know him. You must believe. Oh, full slow of heart, he says, to believe. So, what did Peter see? Peter saw 
Christ in the words of the prophets. He saw the Father in the Son. So, you learn something here? He saw Christ in the words of the prophets. Let me say this very quickly. <laughs> I had to correct someone this morning um, who said, forget the Old Testament. Eh? If you remove the Old Testament, the four gospels is a comic. Superman Jesus. <laughs> it becomes a, you know what they call these, uh, all these uh, comical heroes? What, what they call, there's a name they call them. Superhero. It's not, uh? Super striker. <laughs> it is Barcelona man, you are here again. Uh? This man, you pray for this man. He's serving an idol. I want to deal with you publicly. And somebody else at that place. They you know, have idols. Human beings. Oh. We'll pray for you uh, tomorrow. Uh, how did I get here again? Yeah. Someone just came out. Ta-da. I am Jesus. Your tongue with that word. Ba, 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 ba. Wow. I never see this kind before. Wonder, 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 wonder. No! It's a fulfillment of prophecy. Hallelujah. Read your copy Come. Long time ago, the legends of known. There was a, oh, I am Jesus. Then an angel just appeared to Mary. Hey, babe. You're pregnant, okay? I said, eh? Yeah, you're pregnant. You give back to a guy. That guy will shock the wall. <laughs> no. The angel and Mary knew what they were both talking about. Be it unto me. According to your word. Because the message was from the Old Testament. <laughs> Hallelujah. He didn't just appear. Ga, ga, ga. Hey, I don't come. No, 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 no. It's... So if you remove the Old Testament, Jesus becomes a superhero. But when you hear the words of the prophets, then you see God has brought his word to pass. Hallelujah. Are you still there? Come on, Matthew 16. Have some time to go. Come on. So he says to Peter, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Verse 18. I give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever things you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever things you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Let me say something quickly. If Jesus preaches a message different from the Old Testament, he can't be the Christ. He can't be the Christ. He can't be. So, the focus of Christ's teaching was a prophet's focus. So, Christ's kingdom must be the kingdom of Genesis to Malachi. If he doesn't teach from the prophets, if he doesn't explain from the prophets, he's not the Christ. He's the rabbi, the teacher of the scriptures. Now, go to Luke 24, 44. You learning something? Luke 24, 44. So when it says, upon this rock, it must be the rock of the Old Testament. We'll sort that out in the second session. Okay. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. It must also be the church of the Old Testament. Hallelujah. Okay. So look at 44. All these things must indeed be fulfilled, which I said to you. That's 44. Look at it. Luke 24. 
while I was yet with you. Hear this now. Which were written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. So, Jesus' vocabulary will be Old Testament vocabulary. So, what he said in his resurrection is not different from what he taught in the four Gospels. Neither is it different from the word of God on the lips of the prophets. They are the same. So, watch this now. Which means, the things that Jesus said in the four Gospels were largely things that were never fulfilled there. He summarized all his sermons by saying they were to be fulfilled. So, much of Jesus' sermons were promises. In the four Gospels. We saw one. When he says, Love your enemy. Matthew 5, 44. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Bless them that curse you. That never happened till the resurrection. They are words of the kingdom. Those guys didn't do that in the four gospels. But when you read their letters, they wrote it. So all his parables were parables of the kingdom. They are parables of the resurrection. They are parables of his kingdom, that event. So in Luke 24, 25 to 27, all fools, he says, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Beginning that Moses and all the prophets, verse 27, he expounds them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Listen to this. That wasn't the first time he would teach that. Because we just saw in verse 44. These are the same things he said while he was with them. So all his sermons were about his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. All his parables. If he taught differently, he wouldn't be the Christ. So Christ's sermons were not Christ-centered only in the resurrection. They were only understood in the resurrection. So, we'll go back to the four Gospels and we'll see. Are you ready? They are the same. What Jesus taught in his resurrection and what he taught before the resurrection, they are the same. The mode of communication must have been different, but the truth was the same thing. The emphasis, the focus, was the focus of the prophets. He must teach from the Old Testament. Now, if you, I'm going to say something now. Now stop writing. Let's see something now. What again is unbelief? The wisdom of this world. So, if God says something, you interpret it in God's terms. You don't use the excellency of wisdom. All right? So, that means when Jesus preaches from the Old Testament, he will use God's vocabulary. Because what it means is, what you call something is what I must call it. If I call, if you say, this is a house. And I said, ah, I went to school now. It's a chair. That is the wisdom of this world. So it's what he calls it 
that it is. Look at John 2. Now, this was the first miracle. I, I've seen some uh, Bible illiterates. You know, the worst illiterate is the one who preaches from the Bible doesn't understand. And it's unfortunate because I, I, I was saying something the other day that when, when we were younger in ministry, I'm still a young man, I got many more years ago. Um, we, we, when we had some of the first meetings I had in the 90s, who go to a typewriter to type the flyer. You say, type it there, type there. Word resource seminar. That's not the R. R O R E. You say, ah, if you, mean there, you know, leave me alone. Start typing. Uh, okay, put it there. Your life will never remain the same. Write it your life. Put that. Uh, they, not take, they do photocopy. That's flyer. So most of the people you give it to, you know them. Make sure you call them. So whatever you say in those meetings will, be, will still be cryptos. Your ignorance can't go far. You know those who came. In fact, there was a time like that that we had this fellowship that those of us who leave the house are the same people that will go do the church and will go back home like that. We will come together. That is real fellowship. <laughs> you know that? So you can ha- it's easy, but now you see people that should be mentored in everything. They're already on social media and they will talk boldly. The woman will say, I've been in the ministry since, since. He's trying to remember. <laughs> Five years. No, it's four. No, it's seven. It's eight. Oh, yes. Yes. He's a boy. But he will say things. And people will say, that's it? What? You are a blessing. You know it's a sin. Somebody is preaching error. You say the gospel prospers in your hand. What gospel? Ah. That's not right, though. You will give account of all political statements we make in this. <laughs> so, when people uh, don't join the multitude to do evil, a guy said, Miracles is not exegesis. That's a daft preacher. Jesus didn't do miracles without the explanation of scriptures. Every miracle of Christ explained the kingdom. Every miracle is when you are daft, you make statements like you are, you took something that spiked your system. Now, I'm not saying this as a joke. I consider the preaching of the gospel as a delicate work. Because these are not ordinary words. Your words can transmit faith or unbelief or rebellion towards God. So watch what you say. I told you, God doesn't just want you to teach his truth. He wants you to teach his truth truthfully. Now, why would you say that? Every miracle of Christ has an explanation. We wrote a book, The Charismatic Ministry. You need to read it. It has a whole lot of that information in there. Look at John 2. Christ's first miracle. Now, notice what the woman, the mother asked him. There was a, it was a wedding. John said a wedding. A marriage in the kind of Galilee. And Jesus was not the one officiating. That's vital. And then she comes to Christ and says they have no wine. And then he says, woman, what have I to do with you? My hour is not yet come. So I say, when you are, when, when you are, when we are someone's mother, you can make him do what he didn't want to do. Jesus didn't want to do miracle, but his mother just came. Son, he said, Woman, I don't want to do miracles yet. No! <laughs> you should have asked, 
what is God's wine. Remember, God's wine is not man's wine. The moment you see God's wine as man's wine, then that is the foolishness of God in the heart <laughs> of the wise. When she said they have no wine, that is true for humanity. Then he says, my hour. What do you mean by my hour? When Jesus used the statement, my hour, you need to read the whole of the book of John. The hour refers to a particular time. John 4, 23. The hour cometh and now is. John 5. John 5. Verse 28, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in that which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. John chapter 12. Are you there? John 12, verse 23, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. John 17. And verse 1, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son will glorify you. She was talking about physical wine. Jesus was talking about God's wine. My hour hasn't come. The hour for God's wine. So when he turned the water to wine, it was a miracle that was symbolic of what will happen in the resurrection. Water refers to humanity. The new wine, all the wine, refers to the resurrection. Every miracle had an explanation of the promise of the resurrection. Every miracle, every miracle that he did, it was meant to explain his work. The water to wine, in this instance, refers to humanity and then divinity. In Mark 2, 22, don't put new wine in old wine skins. He's making, he's not talking symbolically. He's talking about God's wine. Remember, if you receive this with the wisdom of men, that will be the foolishness of God. But if you see God's wine as your wine, that's faith in the gospel. God's wine must be your wine. And God's wine is not found in cups. In Matthew 26, are you learning something? <laughs> Look at this. Matthew 26. Look at this scenario. They are at the table, the Passover table, now called the communion table. Then something they had been eating for years and years and years and years and years and years. Then he sits with them, pay attention. In 26, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Take, eat, this is my body. And the guy sits right in front of you and says, Eat, this is my body. I have not asked questions. In other words, the bread of God is the body of Christ. This is my body. So when he says, take, let's do, let's do a, a, an illustration here. So he sits here. They have bread on the table. Then he says, take, eat. This is my body. Now, where will faith come? The elements or his words? So what should you pay more attention to? The elements or what he's saying? Now, remove the bread. Take away the symbols on the table. Assuming he's just talking to them. Take my body. Eat it. It is broken for you. Would you have imagined physical bread? No. You will have known he's talking literally about himself. So the person of faith will ignore those symbols. Just like Moses, you will listen to the words because faith comes by hearing. Faith is by hearing the message. Look at the message. The message is what he said. And don't forget, it, my body there, is not 
His, listen what I'm going to say, is not his body on the cross. Is his resurrection. It's broken for you. It's shared for you. Jesus became available for all of us in the resurrection. Now watch this again. He says, he took the cup, gave thanks and he gave it to them. And he says, drink ye all of it. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the remission of sins of many. Did this happen on this table? Did it happen before now? When did this happen? So, many things he thought never happened till he died. Just like this. So, look at the next statement now. Let's take verse 29 together. Everybody, let's go. But I say unto you, Matthew 26, let's go. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you where? So, what is God's wine? resurrection life of Jesus. When he says, woman, my hour isn't yet. My hour for the new wine. He gave them new wine, all right, which was figurative of the new wine. God's new wine is in his resurrection. Resurrection of the son. So, the Passover can't be dead. The Passover has to be alive because if you say Passover means death will pass over, the Passover has to be alive. So Christ became our Passover in his resurrection. Christ, our Passover, he sacrificed for us. 1 John 5, 7. Because you can't have resurrection without death. He triumphed over death. That's why he died. You can't triumph over death without dying. He died and rose again and became our Passover. First Corinthians 5, 7. So Moses, he's using bread, animals. Why is he using bread and animals? Because of the hardness of their heart. He need not use any symbol. Because faith is by hearing. It's by hearing. So our Passover is in the resurrection. That's why in John 6, he says, this bread will give you eternal life. Hallelujah. You learning something? You sure about that? Look at Matthew 13, verse 29. So in Luke 22, verse 18. Yes. Luke 22, verse 18. I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. When was that? Is that his hour? Was that the day? Talk to me. Is that the bread? Is that the bread? The bread of God? The wine of God? The body? So, if I call wine, which comes from the tree in the cup, that they serve in parties, that's the wisdom of this world. What's God's wine? Which one do you believe in? So if you take God's wine as wine in a cup, what do you have? The wisdom of this world. Hallelujah. <laughs> so the issue is, whose wine are you referring to? If it's God's wine, it's his life. If it's man's wine, it's in a glass. If you take God's wine as man's wine in a glass, then the power of God is weakness to you. The wisdom of God is foolishness to you. Because God's wisdom is superior to man's wisdom. It's what God calls it that it is. 
Whatever God calls wine, that's what wine is. And the wine is in his resurrection. You learning something there? <laughs> so what is his rock? We'll leave that out a bit. Learn very well. Now, get this quickly. You know, Jesus said, these are the things that the prophet said. So, if I understand what the prophet said, I will understand what Jesus said. If I read the prophets together and read the four gospels together, I will see that they use the same vocabulary. The same way Jesus sat at the table of the Passover and said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood. That's the same way Moses will lift up a serpent. But he didn't expect you to look at the stick or the brazen serpent. He expected you to listen to what he was saying. Oftentimes when we read the Old Testament, we look at the Character, uh, what we call the experiences, the activities. But there's no faith in the activities. The faith is in the message. So if you, if you get stuck on the activity, you will lose the message. If in the wedding at Cana of Galilee, you were all about water to wine, you lost the message. If Right on that table, it was about bread and wine on the table. You lost the message. The message is in what he said. Hallelujah. Who's following what I'm saying here right now? So, what is his wine? His wine is his life. So, human activity, human symbolisms, human discoveries are symbolic. Is what God says that it is. That it is. God's wine, hallelujah, is in the resurrection of his son. Praise the Lord. That's what he calls it. In John 2, the same place. Let's see something quickly. Let me just run over this one. You ready? In John 2, the same place. He goes into the temple. Into the temple. And then he says to them, in verse 14, 15, he drives out those who were exchanging money. Then he says, in verse 16, take these things and make not my father's house a house of merchandise. You and I know that building was not his father's house. Just like I said earlier, much of what he said was fulfilled where? When he died. He was preaching the kingdom. Make not my father's house. Can we say the body of Christ? Can we say the assembly of saints? Had that happened there? No. Make not my father's house. A place of merchandise. And then he began to argue and all that. Then he says to them in verse 19, destroy this temple in three days. I'll raise it up. He had already explained himself. Hallelujah. <laughs> he is the father's house. He is that temple. I need your attention here now. And then, ah, uh, is this guy well? He says, <laughs> because they didn't know what God called his own temple. So he now says to them, after three days, I'll raise it up. And then he began to argue. Look at 21. Let's say 21 together. But he spake of the temple of his body. Let's take 22 slowly. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them and they believed. Wait, 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 wait. They believed what? They believed what? What's the scripture? Genesis to Malachi. Was Jesus quoting any verse? Are you thinking? So that means all the while, what was the temple in the Old Testament was the same thing Jesus was referring to. So the Old Testament has a message when it says temple. The temple of the Old Testament was a promise. They believed the whole Testament. 
So if I go into the Old Testament, what I will see is the temple. It can't be the physical building. I'll ignore the activities. I'll listen to the message. They believed what was called the temple. They believed the scriptures. Jesus says the scriptures cannot be broken. When you hear the scriptures, it's telling you the centrality of the message. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. How Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He's not quoting any verse. Kata tom grafo. How Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. How he was buried and raised again the third day according to the scriptures. That is, when you read the scriptures together, this is what you're going to see. When you read the Old Testament together, you could never have said the temple is a physical building. That's what they're saying. So they believe the scriptures. John 7, 37. Come to me, who the thirsty, and I'll give you water. For as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. No particular scripture was being quoted. That means when you read the Old Testament, the water is from his resurrection. In other words, you and I, I'll close here, we need to get accustomed to the words, thank you, to the words of the Old Testament, to the words of the scriptures. Hallelujah. What is the rock? What is the water? Glory to God. What is the wine? Everything is in the message. Hallelujah. What is the wine? The scriptures cannot be broken. So, look at Luke 9. I will just close on that. Luke's Gospel 9. Remember, Jesus' summons were quoted many times from Moses. Some people say, ah, don't follow Moses. Moses is dead. I really don't know what that means. How do you, how, see, in the temptation of Jesus, the three scriptures he quoted were from Moses. The three. Hallelujah. The three. Man shall not live by bread alone. Moses. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Moses. Thou shalt not worship any other God beside him. Who else? Moses. That means he knew what Moses was talking about. Hallelujah. When he rose from the dead, where did he explain his resurrection from? Beginning from where? Moses. And all the prophets, which were written again in the law of Moses. So, Christ's wine was Moses' wine. Christ's water was Moses' water. Christ's rock has to be Moses' rock. Luke 9. Close there. You learning something? You learning something here? Praise the Lord. Luke 9. At the Mount of Transfiguration. Which you see in Matthew 17. Verse 28. It came to pass about eight days after this saints. He took Peter and John and James and went up the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. His raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah. This is actually vision. All right, just like Acts 10. Look at verse 31. Who appeared in glory. I speak of his disease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. 
That means the words of the prophet of the Old Testament came to those three guys in a vision. The word he sees there is the word Exodus. The Exodus of Moses is Christ's death and resurrection. The message of the scriptures is the same. The kingdom of God in the Old Testament is the kingdom of God in the four gospels. And it's his kingdom in his resurrection. Christ is the fulfillment of the message of the Old Testament. Every miracle, every statement, every act of Christ they were to show us that message that kingdom the kingdom that is not a place an event an identity an identification and he says thou art Peter upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it I'll give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever things you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever things you lose on earth is loosed in heaven. This is the day. This is the day. This is the time. This is the hour. We have the new wine today. We have the bread of God today. Hallelujah. And it's sufficient for us. We have the new wine. We have the bread of God. We have the water of God. Don't say no. Uh, it, it's not a symbol. The word of God is not a symbol. The word of God is real. This is life. He calls it living water. So just like Peter, I receive those things as what God says they are. I don't glorify man's intellect. What man calls water is the word God calls water. What man calls wine is what God calls wine. And whatever God says it is, that is what it is to me. Be blessed this morning. Stand to your feet, lift your hands and bless the Lord. Thank you. Sing a blessing. That song was composed by a great man of God, Brother Golan Wukukoy. I knew when he did. And what a song. It's a conversation. If only you know how much I love you. If only you know how much I care. If only you know this is the reason why I came to die and take your place. Then the believer now responds, Oh Lord, I know you really love me. Hallelujah. If only you know how much I love you. Got it wrong, oh. Change it up. This is the reason why I came. Reason to die and take your place. The riches of your grace. Sorry, the riches of my grace. Miss I'm mixing up. If only you know how much I love you.
my grace. No. Now respond. Oh Lord, I know. Respond. Oh Lord. Oh, Lord, I know. 